Ladies and gentlemen, I know that for many of you, part of the motive that has drawn you to these lectures has been your desire to learn how to apply the philosophy of Atlas Shrugged to your own life. Some of you have described the sensation while reading Atlas of being transported into another universe, of experiencing a new perspective, a different sense of life, a different sense of what was possible. But you often complained that you were unable to keep this sense of life, that you lost it when you returned to the everyday reality of your ordinary concerns, that it became like a dream or a distant longing, or worse, was forgotten for months at a time. And you asked, why did this happen? What could one do to maintain the Atlas Shrugged sense of life? How could one keep that perspective alive, and how could one implement it so that it would be more than an abstract dream? In different ways, that is the question that I have been answering during these past 19 weeks by giving you the intellectual foundation of the Atlas Shrug sense of life. But there is one aspect of the problem still to be discussed, and that is contained in the title of this, the final lecture, why many human beings repress and drive underground not the worst within them, but the best. Repression is commonly understood to mean the excluding from conscious awareness of immoral thoughts or desires, the excluding from conscious awareness of the irrational, the undesirable, the evil within one. When one thinks of repression, one usually thinks of it as pertaining to the bad, not to the good, to the blocking off or repressing of vices, not virtues to the closing of one's mind against the worst within one, not the best. But what I shall demonstrate tonight is that many people do, in fact, repress their noblest and highest, and that this is one of the great causes of man's tragedy and suffering. The concept of repression was not originated by him, but it is, of course, Sigmund Freud who has done most to make men aware of it, because of the crucial and central role which repression plays in Freud's system. Freud conceived of repression as the mechanism by means of which man conceals from himself and drives into the underground of his unconscious the instinctual impulses and desires which are forbidden as evil by the moral beliefs of society. According to Freud's own particular mythology, this meant that man represses his inevitable desire to make love to his mother and to murder his father. But man represses his secret homosexual inclinations, which everyone allegedly shares to a greater or lesser extent. That man represses his basic impulses to torture plunder, brutalize, and engage in cannibalistic practices. This was Freud's concept of man's deepest desires, the desires inherent in man's nature, residing in the so-called id. And while many have rejected this interpretation of man's nature, they still associate repression primarily with the repression of depravity. Freud believed that repression is a psychological necessity of mental health, that man must repress in order to avoid neurosis or psychosis. It is sometimes believed that Freudians are against repression, but this is not true. They are against unsuccessful repression, that is, repression that fails and allows forbidden thoughts, sometimes in distorted forms, entry into consciousness, thus causing guilt, fear, and a variety of neurotic disturbances. Their concept of a totally healthy individual is one who has been fully successful in repression, fully successful in concealing from himself, in burying the nature of his own deepest desires. 
Because Freudians believe that man's desires proceed from his instincts, not from his mind or premises, and because they believe many of those desires to be irrational and immoral, the only hope they can project for man is that he will be able to evade identifying these desires, that he will be able to satisfy them in disguised, sublimated, and socially acceptable ways, and never have to face the truth about what he really is after. Never have to know, for instance, that his love is based on a secret hate, his kindness is based on a secret fear, his ambition is based on a secret lust to destroy. Unfortunately, many psychologists who have properly rejected Freud's instinct theory, as well as much of his concept of what it is that man represses, have nevertheless accepted his premise that repression is psychologically necessary and desirable, that, to some extent, it is a precondition of mental health. What is repression? Repression is a subconscious activity which seeks to keep some ideas, thoughts, feelings, memories out of conscious awareness, to inactivate them, to forbid them entry into consciousness. <coughs> to remind you of some points which I made about the psychology of repression in Lecture 2, in my discussion at that time of the subconscious. To repress is to establish a mental block that forbids a thought entry into consciousness and into the tool of consciousness, namely language. If, in the value system a mind has formed, there is the explicit or implicit premise that that which the mind finds painful or which clashes with its self-esteem is not to be perceived, then the subconscious, functioning as an obedient instrument, takes the order literally. No such forbidden thoughts are allowed into consciousness. Such repression, once instigated, continues to operate automatically and subconsciously. Forbidden ideas will not be verbalized, forbidden desires will not be recognized, forbidden emotions will not be identified. They will continue to exist in the subconscious and to influence behavior. A is A, facts are objective and not to be wiped out by self-made blindness, but they will be given no acknowledgement. The man whose self-esteem, for instance, in part depends on being above any feelings of envy, may thus not know that envy is what he feels for his more competent rival. He will have a dozen sensible explanations to account for his antagonism and hatred, or he will go out of his way to praise that rival. The woman whose religious beliefs forbid it may not perceive that she desires her best friend's husband. She will not know why she avoids him nor why she is irritated by her own husband's every action. The compulsive woman chaser may literally not remember the name of the one woman who spurned him. The professional humanitarian may never allow into words the knowledge that what he feels at the sight of those who suffer and depend on him is a sense of pleasure and power. The son who sacrifices the career he wanted for the sake of his mother who opposed it may never identify that what he now feels toward her is the desire to kill. When they develop neurotic symptoms, those who repress may cry that they are the helpless victims of their malevolent subconscious. But the truth is that the subconscious does not have a will of its own. It has no secret diabolical purposes. It is a machine run by the premises it is fed. And if men feed it contradictions, evasions, and self-destroying injunctions, they pay a psychological price calculated by the most ruthlessly logical of computers. Repression is the establishment of a standing order, in effect, that certain facts, ideas, or feelings are not to be perceived or integrated. Mental health does not require of man total omniscience concerning the contents and operation of his subconscious. It does not require of man a full and total memory of every event and experience his consciousness has ever registered, nor of every association and conclusion his consciousness has ever formed. But it does require the absence on the conscious and subconscious level of any premise forbidding knowledge. 
It requires of man that he place no value above consciousness, no value above awareness, which means, of course, no value above reality. It requires that, as he grows older, man learn to translate into language the subverbal conclusions of his childhood and test them against reality in the light of his adult understanding. And it requires of man that, when he acts, his actions never clash with his conscious convictions. It is not in the nature of man that his subconscious should be to him what Freud has made it, namely an object of dread. But if man seeks to bury in his subconscious the reality he refuses to face, then it is not his subconscious but reality that becomes its own avenger. Ignorance is not bliss, not in any realm or aspect of man's life, and least of all with regard to knowledge of his own psychology. Man is fallible, he is capable of drawing mistaken conclusions and of feeling desires that proceed from irrational premises, but because man is a being of volitional consciousness, he has the possibility of correcting those premises, of revising his thinking or non-thinking, and thereby of correcting his emotions and desires. Now, in understanding this concept of repression, it is very essential to distinguish it from a process with which it is sometimes confused, namely suppression. Repression amounts to self-deception and is undesirable, but there are many instances in which suppression is fully both desirable and necessary. Suppression, in contradistinction to repression, is both conscious and directly volitional. It consists of the deliberate switching of one's focus from one line of thought or area to another, that is to push aside some consideration because it's imperative that one look elsewhere or concern oneself with some other consideration. For instance, suppose you are having an argument with someone and find that you are growing angry. You decide to suppress the emotion. That is, you do not pretend to yourself that you are not angry, you do not repress, but you do not give vent to your anger, you do not let it consume you, you turn your mind to the task of clarifying the disagreement. You focus only on that, and you consciously and volitionally ignore what you feel in order to think more clearly and efficiently. There are obviously many instances in which suppression such as this is both desirable and necessary. Let me contrast repression with suppression in the following way. Suppose that before coming here tonight, you have a conversation with a friend who says or does something that deeply hurts you. Now suppose you had concluded in the past that a truly independent person can never be hurt by anyone. Suppose you had internally resolved never to be hurt by anyone, no matter what. You had made your invulnerability to being hurt a matter of your self-esteem. This would be a perfect formula for repression. You would not feel when you arrived here, I'm hurt, but I won't think about it now. I'll concentrate on the lecture and consider the other issue later. No, instead you would feel, hurt? No, I'm not hurt. Why should I be hurt? You may be vaguely conscious of a numb sensation in your chest, of an odd sense of disconcerting heaviness, but you will not identify its meaning or source there will be a violent resistance against the words that would name your actual state. That state, which you do not identify, is the product of the collision of two thoughts within your subconscious. I'm hurt, and I must never be hurt. Now, if you merely suppressed your hurt instead of repressing it, you would possess a full knowledge of your actual emotional condition. You would openly acknowledge to yourself that you feel badly, but you would decide that, for the purpose of grasping the lecture, you will temporarily deflect your focus from your pain and think about it later. Now, the practical difference is this. A painful or disturbing emotional state that is admitted and identified can, if the state is unwarranted, be corrected or resolved. One can do whatever is necessary in order to deal with it. But an emotional response one does not permit oneself to experience or to face is like pressure building up to an explosion, an explosion that frequently results in neurotic symptoms. 
as I have stated in a previous context, premises will out. They cannot be negated by self-made blindness. They can only, if repressed, leave one the more helplessly at their mercy. Unfortunately, repression is encouraged by the prevalent belief that to feel certain emotions is the irredeemable proof of one's evil. In fact, it is not a man's irrational emotions that constitute the proof of his evil, but the fact that he acts on them against the judgment of his mind. Emotions as such are involuntary. They are the automatic summation of one's premises. Man can make mistakes in his premises, and he can experience emotions which he knows to be inappropriate or irrational. His moral stature will be a function of what he then proceeds to do about them. If he struggles to understand and correct them, he is not evil, even though he may have been in the past. But if he acts on the premise that his emotions are blindly to be followed, if he abdicates his reason, that is what makes him immoral. But when, for instance, the Bible tells man that if in his heart he lusts after his neighbor's wife, that is the same as actually committing adultery with her, what can a man do if he accepts this, yet feels the desire, except frantically repress the desire and blind himself to its existence, lest he be forced to damn himself as evil? How many people indefinitely perpetuate irrational emotions of hate, fear, jealousy, and rage by repressing them, by never daring to identify what they feel, and thus cement their mistaken premises into their soul? Just as it is an error to regard one's irrational emotions as the irredeemable proof of one's evil, so it is equally an error to regard one's rational emotions as the infallible proof of one's virtue. It is true that rational emotions are the product of rational premises, which are the product of rational thinking, and can thus be taken as an indirect sign of past virtue. But if one merely contemplates one's ideals, feels love, reverence, inspiration, but never does any further thinking about those ideals or about how they are to be achieved in reality, if one does not live by them, one is not a man of virtue, one is a traitor, regardless of the nobility, in quotes, of one's feelings or aspirations. There is only one rational basis of self-esteem and only one rational standard of virtue, namely the act of thinking, the dedication of one's mind to the perception of reality, the commitment of one's consciousness to an absolute acceptance of reason. Let a man tie his self-esteem not to the act of thinking, but to the things he feels or doesn't feel. Let him take as the standard of his fitness for reality the content of his emotions, and he has opened the door to repression, to the blocking out of any emotion or desire that conflicts with his concept of what one is properly supposed to feel. <laughs> it's appropriate here to remember Francisco's statement to Reardon. There are no evil thoughts except one, the refusal to think. Now, what of those who seek to repress not their vices, but their virtues? How can a man reach the state of believing that the best within him is a threat to his self-esteem, a threat to his fitness for existence? That is the question to which I shall now turn. I shall begin by asking you to think back to the earliest days of your childhood. Every child and every adult needs the conviction that he is living in an intelligible universe, that the world around him and the people in it are such that his consciousness can grasp and deal with them. Every child starts out by expecting rationality consistency and intelligibility from the human beings he encounters. He desires to understand and to be understood. He does not begin with the malevolent conviction that life is chaos, that nothing makes sense, that irrationality, inconsistency, and injustice are all he can hope to expect. He begins, and you began, 
with the assumption and expectation of a benevolent universe, by which I mean a universe in which happiness and fulfillment, not misery and frustration, will be one's natural state, of a world in which the people one encounters will be honest, open, direct, and rational. I do not mean, of course, that such an attitude and expectation is conscious or conceptualized in a child's mind, but only that such is the implicit expectation of a healthy consciousness at the start of its life. How many of you expect it now? The question is, what happened in the years between? What happened to that sense of life? If today someone were to act irrationally or unjustly toward you, if they were suddenly to act in a manner drastically contradictory to what you had been led to expect, many of you would shrug in tired, numb resignation and feel, in effect, that's life. You'd probably reproach yourself if you had felt any degree of shock. Today you are not on the premise of expecting rationality or consistency. And when I say expecting it, I do not mean this merely in the statistical sense, I mean it in the metaphysical sense. I mean that most of you have come to accept irrationality, not merely as the statistically average or predominant, but for all practical purposes as the metaphysically normal, as the necessary and inevitable in human nature. Now, of course, there are irrationalists, such as James Taggart, who dread rationality or justice and who want to think of men as depraved. These are persons who, early in life, willfully and deliberately chose evil as their own mode of existence. But it's not of them that I am speaking. I am speaking, to paraphrase Galt, of man the victim, not man the killer. That is of those who, at least predominantly, carry within them the submerged desire for a rationality which they have given up seeking or expecting to find in those they meet. The steps by which an individual gives it up begin in childhood. First, with the irrationalities of his parents, the contradictions, the broken promises, the arbitrary, unexplained injunctions, the incomprehensible punishments and the incomprehensible rewards. Then, with the aunt or uncle, perhaps, who had started out by being so kind and understanding, but who, out of a bad mood, slapped the child's face one day and shouted at him angrily for no reason within the child's power to understand. Then, with the playmate, who suddenly and unexpectedly smashed his favorite toy out of sheer spite because the playmate's mother would not buy him one like it. Then with the teacher who made unwarranted and sarcastic criticisms of him in class in order to vent her own neurotic frustration and hostility while the other students looked on and laughed in order to stay on the good side of the teacher. Then with the girl who deserted him for a boy of whom she had previously spoken with contempt. Then with his first employer on his first part-time job who gave him switching and mutually irreconcilable orders and would blame anyone around him, but never admit that he, the employer, had made a mistake. All of these experiences, or their equivalents, adding up through childhood and adolescence to the unstated feeling that any rational understanding, communication, or closeness with other human beings is impossible, and that one is childish, or naive, or unrealistic, or a sucker to count on or expect it. This, in principle, is the basic pattern by which a child can give up not only his expectation of encountering rationality, but of achieving any intimate value affinity, any value closeness with those around him. From his first passion, perhaps, for the heroes of childhood stories, which neither his parents nor playmates shared, cared about, or understood, to his observation that the things that interested others he found meaningless and boring, to his dismay when the friend he had found at last, who seemed to share his values, criticized him one day for not being a regular fellow like the rest of the kids. 
to the girls who admired him for his independence but preferred more conventional boys for dates, to the companions who claimed to like him but who were bored by or resented those qualities of which he felt most proud. All of these experiences, or their equivalents, adding up to a feeling of helplessness in human relationships, to a sense of estrangement and isolation and metaphysical loneliness. If one could communicate such concepts to a child of five, and if one were to tell him that he would reach the day when he would claim to be indifferent to human rationality, the day when he would claim that nothing hurt or disappointed him in relation to other people, since he did not expect anything good from anyone, the day when he would lose the knowledge of what it was he had wanted from people and pass by in resigned indifference those who might have had it to offer, the day when, if he found something great, he would be too embarrassed to express the admiration it deserved for fear of being rebuffed, the day when he would no longer be able to believe in the reality of that greatness even when he found it, the day when he would feel guilt and self-reproachful over any flicker within him that still wanted it, that still wanted life to be dramatic, exciting, romantic, important, the day when he would freeze and discourage others who wanted it, as others long ago had frozen and discouraged him, the child would not believe it. He would protest that he will never reach such a day. But you know how many children do reach it, as you know in what manner most of you have reached it. Have you ever wondered why you were unaccountably touched, almost to the point of pain, when someone showed an unexpected kindness toward you? Have you ever wondered why you sometimes wanted to cry, not at a sight that is ugly, but at a sight that is beautiful? Not at music that is tragic, but at music that is irresistibly gay. Not in a moment of suffering, but in a moment of happiness. Have you ever wondered why you find it so painfully difficult to speak of the things that matter most to you, even with those who are closest and most trusted? Have you ever wondered why you sometimes felt ashamed at your own uncharacteristic expression of some deeply intense and serious emotion and felt compelled to make a joke at your own expense in the next moment? Have you ever wondered why you sat passively while values you despised were being praised and values you respected were being attacked, and you remained silent and unprotesting, not necessarily or exclusively out of fear, but also out of a heavy, weighted feeling amounting to the words, what's the use? The name we have given to the premise that makes this possible, the premise that leads men to submerge the best within them, is the malevolent universe premise. The malevolent universe premise is the belief, usually held only in the form of an emotion or generalized feeling, that the good, that is, that which one most deeply values and desires, has no chance on earth, that there is no way to achieve one's deepest values among other men. That premise is normally experienced as a sense of life, it has the feeling of a metaphysical conviction, of a fundamental view of one's relationship to existence. Usually, this premise is formed by a process of emotional generalization, by moving from the observation that many men are irrational to the desperate feeling that, for no reason one can understand, men will inevitably be irrational. Not all of those who hold this premise would identify it consciously. Perhaps the majority would not. Many would actively deny that they hold it, but it is nonetheless the unstated implication of much of their behavior. While such a premise as a metaphysical conviction is mistaken because it amounts, in effect, to a damnation of human nature as such, I do not have to point out why even the best among men could be tempted to such an error. One of my purposes in these lectures has been to provide you with philosophical and psychological ammunition against the malevolent universe premise. 
One's values and goals are determined by one's view of existence, by one's view of what is possible. To the extent that one succumbs to the malevolent universe premise, one will necessarily feel that one's deepest values are unachievable, that for all practical purposes they are metaphysically inappropriate, inappropriate to life on earth. And to the extent that one cannot give up those values, one will feel oneself to be, in effect, a metaphysical freak. This premise, residing in the subconscious, will drive one to institute a process of inhibition and repression, to throttle the responses and desires that one feels to be unrealistic and impractical. And the tragic irony is this. One will be driven to it in self-protection in protection of one's self-esteem, in the name of one's desire to be competent to deal effectively with the facts of reality. I should like to tell you a story, an illustration of this issue that was once told to me by a patient. The patient, as an adult, was exceptionally repressed with regard to anything that mattered to him. He tended to conceal or brush over his serious and idealistic values. When he was a young boy, he once entered a bicycle race. He was speeding along and doing very well when suddenly the wheels swerved and he went over the side of an embankment. Bruised and bleeding and with his bicycle twisted and bent, he dragged himself up the hill and rejoined the race. He pedaled furiously, but of course it was too late to win. However, the crowd of the judges were so enthusiastic over his sportsmanship that they gave him a special medal. He felt very proud and happy about it and ran eagerly to the stands where members of his family had been watching. Instead of the appreciation he expected, he was met with indignant denunciations from his mother for his recklessness in continuing the race. All she could see was that he had torn his clothes and that he looked a mess. Neither she nor the others present showed any interest in the medal he had received or in the event which had taken place. The boy was terribly hurt, but he clenched his fists as at a weakness in himself, the weakness of wanting understanding and appreciation. He rode home with his family in silence. When they arrived home, the boy went to his room, looked at the medal for a moment, and then hid it in a bottom drawer. He swore that he would never show the medal to anyone, and he had been hiding all the medals of his soul ever since. Because the malevolent universe premise is in fact an error, because one's desire for rationality, for greatness, for human understanding is metaphysically right, that is, is actually consonant with the nature of man and reality, one will not be able to kill one's desire fully. One may have moments of tragic rebellion against one's own repression, but one will nonetheless be paralyzed and helpless to fight for or to achieve one's values in reality to the extent to which this premise is operative. In the Fountainhead, Dominique is an exceptionally noble representative of the malevolent universe error. She does not reach the point of actual repression. She does keep alive, if only within her own mind, the values she is in love with, but she is persuaded that the men of her society are so profoundly and irrevocably committed to irrationality that there is no way for her values to win among them, certainly not in her own lifetime, and she passionately and proudly rebels against the concept of martyrdom. She has too great an integrity to live on the terms of the world, but she considers her own values doomed and unattainable. She is unable to give up her longing for those values, of which Rourke is the symbol, but equally unable to fight for them as Rourke fights, because she is convinced that the world is run by evil, that evil is practical, and that any greatness is sentenced to destruction. When she grasps that the men she had despised are impotent, that it is to Rourke that the earth belongs, that evil has no actual power, she is free of her error. But observe that until she is free of it, until she learns the nature of her mistake, the logic of her premise leads her to fight against Rourke to make his battle harder, not easier. Her motive is love, not hatred. She is acting consistently with her convictions and is trying to stop Rourke before he is destroyed. But motives do not alter facts, 
And so long as she believes that the good has no chance, it is the good that she will hurt. Well, that is the opposite of her intention. She is her own first victim. And Rourke, who is the highest embodiment of her values, has inevitably to be the second. Gail Wineland represents a less excusable variant of the malevolent universe error. Whereas Dominique never morally betrays her values and refuses to compromise with that which she holds to be evil, Wineland, starting out with the same basic error as Dominique's, decides to make terms with evil and to beat it at its own game. In the story of Wineland's youth, the reader is shown the steps by which Wineland acquires his malevolent sense of life. From the injustice and depravity he sees everywhere around him, to the reign of total mediocrity, to the seeming triumph of incompetence, to the sight of widespread cynicism and corruption on every level of society. There are two incidents in Wineland's youth which I should like to quote because they are exceptionally psychologically graphic. The first incident pertains to the time when Wineland first fell in love. Quote, Gail Wineland was 20 when he fell in love. The girl with whom he fell in love had an exquisite beauty, a beauty to be worshipped, not desired. She was fragile and silent. Her face told of the lovely mysteries within her left unexpressed. She became Gail Wynan's mistress. He allowed himself the weakness of being happy. He would have married her at once had she mentioned it. But they said little to each other. He felt that everything was understood between them. One evening he spoke. Sitting at her feet, his face raised to her, he allowed his soul to be heard. My darling, anything that you wish, anything I am, anything I can ever be, that's what I want to offer you. Not the things I'll get for you, but the thing in me that will make me able to get them. That thing, a man can't renounce it, but I want to renounce it so that it will be yours, so that it will be in your service, only for you. The girl smiled and asked, Do you think I'm prettier than Maggie Kelly? He got up, he said nothing, and walked out of the house. He never saw that girl again. Gail Wyland, who prided himself on never needing a lesson twice, did not fall in love again in the years that followed. Close quote. The second incident pertains to the start of Wyland's newspaper career when he was working on the Gazette. Quote, he was 21 when his career on the Gazette was threatened for the first and only time. Politics and corruption had never disturbed him. He knew all about it. His gang had been paid to help stage beatings at the polls on election days. But when Pat Mulligan, police captain of his precinct, was framed, Wynan could not take it, because Pat Mulligan was the only honest man he had ever met in his life. The Gazette was controlled by the powers that had framed Mulligan. Wynan said nothing. He merely put in order in his mind such items of information he possessed as would blow the Gazette into hell. His job would be blown with it, but that did not matter. His decision contradicted every rule he had laid down for his career, but he did not think. It was one of the rare explosions that hit him at times, throwing him beyond caution, making of him a creature possessed by the single impulse to have his way because the rightness of his way was so blindingly total but he knew that the destruction of the Gazette would be only a first step. It was not enough to save Mulligan. For three years, Wineland had kept one small clipping, an editorial on corruption by the famous editor of a great newspaper. He had kept it because it was the most beautiful tribute to integrity he had ever read. He took that clipping and went to see the great editor. He would tell him about Mulligan, and together they would beat the machine. He walked far across town to the building of the famous paper. He had to walk and help to control the fury within him. He was admitted into the office of the editor. He saw a fat man at a desk with thin slits of eyes set close together. He did not introduce himself, but laid the clipping down on the desk and asked, Do you remember this? The editor glanced at the clipping, then at Wynand. How do you expect me to remember every piece of swill I write? asked the editor. After a moment, Wynan said, thanks. It was the only time in his life that he felt gratitude to anyone. The gratitude was genuine, a payment for a lesson he would never need again. But even the editor knew that there was something very wrong in that short thanks and very frightening.
she did not know that it had been an obituary on Gail Winans. Close quote. Notwithstanding Winans' error and the consequences to which it leads, Winans is a man of passionate ambition and enormous self-esteem. The self-esteem that makes it impossible for him to seek or to find any actual enjoyment in his victories, and that makes him incapable fully of losing the idealism with which he started, which is why Rourke loves him. But because Wynand does not withdraw as Dominique does, because he is willing to succeed by means of that which he considers evil, he is led to acquire in the later years of his life a vested interest in the belief that the good is impractical in order to justify his own course and to persuade himself that there is no alternative. This is why he is driven to corrupt men of apparent integrity and why at first he tries to corrupt Rourke. There is a part of him that still desperately wants a man such as Rourke to exist and to be possible, but it is this that he will not admit to himself, it is this that he has repressed until the best within him asserts itself and the strength of his feeling for Rourke finally breaks down Wynand's repressive barrier. Wynand, at least in his early years, is morally innocent. He believes that no other course of action is possible if one wishes to live on earth at all. But observe in how many ways Rourke, who does not adopt the malevolent universe premise, who does not surrender the world to evil, who does go on fighting for his values, is made to pay the price of Wynand's error. Dr. Robert Stadler and Atlas Shrugged is another representative of the malevolent universe error, and here you are shown the ultimate calamitous consequences to which it can lead. Stadler, too, begins by making a morally innocent error. A genius caught in a swamp of mediocrity, he decides that men are incurably irrational and predominantly stupid, that a man of the mind has no way to deal with them. His constant cry is, what can you do when you have to deal with people? But when Stadler endorses the State Science Institute, when he sets out to gain the values he wants from others by the use of physical force, he sells his soul to the very brutes he despises. He crosses the line from victim to killer, and thereafter he is compelled, by the logic of his chosen course, to evade and repress the noblest premises of his past, to dread the very men of the mind for whom he had passionately longed, and to end up as an enemy of reason and as the would-be destroyer of John Galt. At the end of the story, he is viciously committed to the malevolent universe premise as his moral life belt. He must believe that the world is evil and that only evil is practical in order to evade the enormity of his own treason. Whereas Wynand is at least partially redeemed by the realization that O'Rourke can win and be practical, Stadler, because his betrayal is greater, dissolves in terror at the possibility that a gulp can be practical. Wineland ends by closing the banner and breaking with the errors of his past. Stadler goes on to total self-destruction. On a lesser scale, there are many men such as Stadler in the world, men who, however they may have begun, end up by wanting it to be a malevolent universe as an excuse and justification for their own immorality or passivity. There are a great many men who have a vested interest in the belief that only evil is practical or that evil is a necessary condition of practical success as an excuse for their own immoral desires. One can be led to a belief in a malevolent universe by different roads and one can hold the belief with different degrees of severity. The noblest and comparatively least severe variant is that represented by Dominic. For Dominique, the problem is conscious. She honestly sees no way for a man of integrity to exist or to function in the world around her. Perhaps the most tragic variant is the individual, of whom there are many, who compounds Dominique's problem by blaming himself for his inability to understand or cope with human irrationality who cannot really believe that people are evil or grasp how it would be psychologically possible for them to be, and who takes his own helplessness and bewilderment as a reflection on his self-esteem, feeling that somehow he should be able to communicate with people even though he has no idea how to do it and has tried everything he does know, 
And in making this error, in taking an honor and self-blame, drives still deeper the belief that he can never succeed on earth, can never achieve his values among other men. But there are those who succumb to the malevolent universe premise with far from full moral innocence. Those who succumb to it, not merely because they have encountered human irrationality and have drawn an unwarranted generalization, but because their own values are an undefined, inarticulate mixture, part rational, part irrational. Those who feel helpless to achieve their values because they never really seek to conceptualize their values, but freeze them on the level of childhood emotions and hold in place of a thought only an incommunicable longing. Those who are too quick to give up when they are not understood immediately and do not bother to ask themselves whether they are fully certain that they have been objective and clear. Those who regard as malevolent any world in which their virtue and efforts are not perceived and rewarded instantly. Those who give up because they expect a ready-made world, a ready-made Atlantis, but will not fight to achieve it and instead surrender it to the realm of the impossible. Then there is the better type of social metaphysician, the type who does possess a muted struggling element of sovereignty and a longing for the rational and the heroic, but who doubts these values precisely because they are his, because his mind has chosen them, and he feels pulled to consign them as he has consigned himself to the status of the metaphysically impractical. To the extent that one is less than fully rational, to the extent that one lives in less than full focus, one only intensifies immeasurably the problem of malevolent universe and repression. One will distrust one's own judgment, one will be uncertain of the validity of one's choices, and one will feel unworthy of one's own highest values and the traitor to one's best and noblest moments. I should like to state parenthetically that an irrationalist such as James Taggart also believes that the universe is malevolent, but in a different sense of the term and for an opposite reason to the one I have been discussing. Observe that for the malevolent universes I have been describing, their problem is social. It pertains to their dealings with other men. It isn't a damnation of the nature of life and existence as such. And further, the world seems malevolent to such people because men are irrational. But James Taggart regards existence itself as malevolent. It is metaphysical reality that he fears and hates, and he hates and fears it because it is rational because it will not grant him his contradictions, because it will not allow him to succeed in gaining his every whim, because it will not allow him to have his evil and his self-esteem too. But to return to those who matter, to the honest, pro-reason, malevolent universes, what they must learn to understand is this, that one's view of life and of the humanly possible is not to be surrendered to the sum of one's statistical encounters with evil. But man is a being of volitional consciousness. He is born neither rational nor irrational, but has the choice to be either. And that one must not renounce one's vision of the ideal because those around one have failed to think and to rise to the level of achieving it. Let me remind you of a thought passage of Dagny's at the banquet given by the looters after they have captured John Galt. Dagny looks at Galt's face and at the faces of the men around him, which are being shown on television screens across the country. Quote, Once they have seen him, thought Dagny, can they wish to look at anybody else? Once they know that he is possible, that this is what man can be, what else can they want to seek? Can they now feel any desire except to achieve in their souls what he has achieved in his? Or are they going to be stopped by the fact that the Mouches, the Morrisons, the Thompsons of the world have not chosen to achieve it? Are they going to regard the Mouches as the human and him as the impossible? Close quote. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the question which I should like to address to you. If in your childhood and adolescence 
you could not find the concepts to name the best and most rational of your values, you have been given them. If you did not have the proof of the objectivity of the metaphysical rightness of those values, you have it now. If you did not know how to fight for those values, you have been told. The question you must now face then is whether you are willing to surrender the sense of life and the vision of what is possible offered to you in Atma Shragd, to renounce it, to repress it, to run in guilty embarrassment from the intensity of your own feelings, to sneer at the best within your own soul and to slap your own face for the sake of values and men that you yourselves despise. Remember that those men want you to surrender the world to them. They want you to regard your values as impractical. They want you to repress and to turn to the pursuit of values that mean nothing to you. They want you stopped and paralyzed by the belief that fulfillment is impossible on earth. If you have ever felt, as I know for a fact that some of you have, that Atlas Shrugged is so great and beautiful a book that it never should have been published and exposed to this evil world, Remember that that is what the Mouches, the Ferrises, the James Taggarts of the world would want you to feel and would have liked nothing better than for Ayn Rand to have felt it too. But if she had, who would have been the victor? To whom would she have surrendered this earth? Evil is impotent and wins only by the default of the good. With every serious passion you renounce because the people around you don't share it, with every compliment you do not pay to those who have earned it, because you fear the recipient will be indifferent. With every statement of love you do not utter, because you equate love with vulnerability and strong feelings with helplessness. With every action you do not take in defense of your values, because you believe they are doomed. With every surrender to silence and passivity in the face of that which you know to be immoral, because of fear, hopelessness, or disgust. With every second-rate pursuit you turn to, because you believe that nothing else is possible, you are contributing to that default which makes the victory of evil possible and are creating the very universe you dread, a universe in which the good has no chance. Let me remind you of another passage from the banquet given for Galt, a passage that describes some of the people who sit looking at Galt. Quote, they were looking at Galt with a desperate plea, with a wistfully tragic admiration, and with hands lying limply on the tables before them. These were the men who saw what he was, who lived in frustrated longing for his world, but tomorrow, if they saw him being murdered before them, their hands would hang as limply and their eyes would look away, saying, Who am I to act? Close quote. If you who have achieved the state of desiring the good withdraw, repress, and give up, what do you do to those who do not give up, who do not repress, who do not hide their medals, but are willing to flaunt them to the world, who are willing to fight for their values alone if necessary, and who are forced to fight alone because of those who are not willing? No, I am not advocating that you become martyrs. I am not telling you to drop everything and go out and convert the world. I am not telling you to die for your values. I am telling you to do something much, much harder to learn how to live for them. The tragedy of repression and the malevolent universe problem is precisely that it incapacitates one for one's values. It discourages the process of continuing conceptualization of one's values the conceptualization that is indispensable if one ever hopes to achieve them. It throttles ambition, stops careers before they have started, and encourages men to settle for the second best in their work as they settle for it in their life, because it undercuts one on the level of incentives. No one will struggle for that which he believes to be impossible. And finally, it can bring one to the day when one has lost the power even to recognize one's values when one's emotional capacity has been so stifled and frozen that one can pass greatness on the street and no longer be able to know it. How does one live for one's values? By never losing 
the desire to achieve them, by never losing the knowledge that one is right and that nothing can matter more than to be right, by taking every rational action in the name of one's values that is open to one and not reproaching oneself for that which is truly beyond one's power, by never surrendering to pain or revulsion so totally that one loses the reality of the values in whose name one is suffering, by never allowing the thousand images of Wesley Mouch to swallow one's vision of John Galt. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not wish to minimize the very real difficulties of living in an age as irrational as the present. We are living in an age which future generations will recognize to be the age of pre-reason. I do not wish to imply that if one fights rationally and conscientiously, one will win every value one desires. Success is never guaranteed to man. The benevolent universe premise is not the certainty of practical victory. It is the conviction that happiness, success, triumph, and fulfillment are the metaphysically normal, the metaphysically appropriate, the natural for man that disaster and calamity are the exception, not the inevitable, that the moral is the practical, that no matter how long or how hard the struggle, it is only the right and the rational that can win on earth, and that the first victory to be won is never to lose this knowledge within one's own mind. What you must understand is this, that however irrational the world around you, such happiness as can be achieved today can be achieved only to the extent that you choose to live by reason and by your best, most honest, long-range values. If you surrender your sovereign view of reality to terms and values you cannot respect, will you achieve a greater happiness or will you cut off all possibility of happiness? If you renounce the career you had wanted and give up to passivity or to work you find meaningless, Will you achieve a greater fulfillment or will you sentence yourself to irredeemable frustration? If you abandon the responsibility of shaping your character and the image of your highest values, will you be more confident to live or will you kill such self-esteem as you have achieved? If you find the world hopelessly bewildering, will rejecting your mind make it more intelligible? This is the choice that now confronts you. To go on repressing, driving deeper until you have killed utterly your highest and most serious values, while your conscious life and practical existence are ruled by another and alien code, and you pass on to others the irrationality that had been passed on to you, or to redeem from the underground of your soul the best and most rational of that with which you started, to bring it into the open, first within your own mind, to fight for it consciously and proudly, and to learn to deserve it. When, as a child, you expected people to be rational, you were right. One should expect rationality of people. Expect it not necessarily in the statistical sense, but in the moral sense. When you expected men and achievements you could admire, you were right. When you expected to be appreciated for your virtues, you were right. When you expected your life to be important, you were right. When you thought that man should be a hero, you were right. That, no matter what is happening around you, is the knowledge you must never allow yourself to lose. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.